here's where we expect you to be in six months. Here's where we expect you to be in a year. I smashed my six month goals in three months and my year goals in six months. Wow. So I was beating expectations. There were other recruiters in the office that had been recruiting for five or 10 years and I was already blowing them out. It wasn't even close. Welcome to Profession Session, where young entrepreneurs, business owners, and professionals come to tell the things that got them into their industry, their story a little bit, and the things that have made them successful. Got Zach Wallace with me here today to talk a little bit about sales, management, his story, his professional life, and everything that kind of led him up to the point he's at now. Zach, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Brody. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. And I wanted to say, very excited to be in the new studio. Zach is the first interview in the new studio. So it's really good, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> a, kind of a work in progress still. You can see it's a little bit in construction, but have it there pretty soon. But it's it's looking pretty good, and I'm excited about it. Let's do it, man. I'm All excited. Right. So, Zach, I wanted to kind of just start out with what got you into your industry. So I, I think we could kind of backtrack to your first couple sales positions, start from there and kind of tell the story of how you got to the position you're in today. And then a little bit more about that. Sure. So, you know, my sales experience or my story is pretty different than most, I'd say. Um, it started off actually at UCF. I was still a student and there was this internship event going on where all these companies would show up. Um, some of them didn't even have openings. They would just show up to have some representation. Um, but basically, you know, this event, you could go and potentially get an internship. At the time, I didn't really have any sort of actual work experience. I worked at One Juicery for a summer, but that was about it. So, um, you know, when I was in class, my professor gave me the list of companies. And so I took some time to really look and review, you know, what opportunities they had. One really stuck out to me though. Um, the company's called Cavalero and I loved everything that they were about. They were big UCF fans. All of their three owners had all gone to UCF and it was just everything about the company was something that I was looking for in my first job. Here's the problem. They weren't, they didn't have any openings available whatsoever. So when I went to this internship opportunity, you know, I, I spent some time, I looked around at some of the companies, but when I knew that I was ready to go to Cavalier, I walked over there and I said, hi, good afternoon. My name is Zach Wallace. And I say, I understand you don't have any openings right now, but I'd love the opportunity to work for your company. And the look on their face when I did that, I mean, no one does that nowadays. And so they were completely shocked. And long story short, they actually ended up making an opportunity for me. They made a new role. It was called a sourcing position. A little bit about Cavalero. Um, they're a IT staffing company. So they do everything from, uh, you know, entry level IT staffing roles to, you know, very senior level. And so my job as a sourcer was basically just to do outbound dials. And that's kind of how I got started with my sales experience. That's and awesome. So you kind of just show up and you, what do you think it was in you that made you like that? made you even willing to say something like that, like <laughs> like willing to even consider like the audacity of you don't have a position open, but I want a position. Like, right. what do you think it was? I mean, I think a big part of it goes, I'm very competitive mm -hmm. and I don't like being told no. Yeah. Um, and so I guess hence why I'm in sales, you know, I, I love that competitive aspect of it. Um, and so I think from, you know, playing sports very young yeah. um, and always pushing myself, you know, I figured, what do I have to lose? You know, a lot of these companies uh, like, like we were talking about before, um, you know, they don't even have openings and a lot of the students don't even take advantage of it. You know, they're just picking up business cards. Some of them may apply, some of them not. I remember Disney, um, nothing against Disney, but <laughs> you know, they had a, I think a line of like 50 or 60 students the whole time. And people would spend the whole hour of the event waiting in line to just put in their, their information. So that way Disney might reach out to them. Yeah. Whereas a company like Cavaliero, um, you know, at the time they were pretty small. Um, even though they didn't have any opportunities, I loved everything about their mission and vision and what they were going after. And so I tried to position myself in a way to, to do that and to get a job. And I think you kind of like the subtext of what you just said there at the end brings up a really good point, which is that you really did your research going into this. A lot of people, I remember going to those events and like most people that would go to those, you know, just show up and kind of walk around like wanting to hear more about the companies, but you actually 
did your research mm-hmm. about the companies, figured out which ones aligned with what you were looking for. I think that's really important because it, you know, how are you going to know what you want if you don't do your research? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you get to Cavaliero, you basically convince them to invent a new position <laughs> for you. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we kind of fill in some of the other gaps of your story, but I have noticed that's kind of a theme with you that you have you kind of figure out how to get these companies to just invent a position for you, which I think is really awesome. I mean, absolutely. What would you attribute some of that ability to convince them to do that to? Do you think hmm. there's got to be something there because I mean, you, obviously you did your research. You you came up. You were bold. You were kind of the the type of person that they were looking for to work for their company, but they didn't have a position open, so they said. What do you think it was that kind of took you to that extra step with them that really like convinced them? I think, I think for me, you know, that was definitely the first time that I kind of threw myself out there, but in my head, I felt like I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah. You know, even at that event, I had other companies that said, listen, you know, I I think you'd be a great fit. We've got an entry level role. I wasn't interested. So I knew that if I really just put, took a, took a shot, you know, just tried, tried my best to have this company take a shot on me. And if it worked out, amazing. If not, okay, on to the next thing. And there's other positions potentially available. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. I love that. So just the the general mindset of nothing to lose, everything to gain. I feel like that's a really important point. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I love that mindset. Absolutely. So by this time, so you're in this new position with Cavaliero. What did that job look like when you first got into it? <laughs> sure. So, you know, I did my research on a company, but uh, I'm sure as anyone that has gotten a job before, there might be a lot more to what you're doing than what you might do research on, oh, yeah. right? So <laughs> uh, a term that I throw around a lot is drinking from a fire hose. Mm-hmm. You know, it was very difficult at first, um, but I had a really good supportive group around me. Um, you know, the staff at Cavalier were amazing. Um, they really did help mentor me. Um, you know, and actually something that I did very early on in my time at Cavaliero was reach out to some of the executives and some of the senior leadership and offer to take them to lunch. Um, and really, you know, yes, in the short term, I'm, I'm losing money, right? I'm paying for their lunch, whatever the case is. But in the long term, I was learning about how they were successful, how they got to that role. Because even though this was a brand new role that Cavaliero had never had before, you know, those people at the time did similar jobs and they gave me invaluable information on how to be successful. Um, so I guess going back to the point about, uh, you know, Cavalier and what that job looked like, you know, I was really just dialing, um, you know, cold calling and it was, it was basically an entry level sales position. So reaching out to people, seeing if they were interested in an opportunity that we had available at the time. Um, the first month or two months, I was probably pushing out maybe 50 to hundred calls a day wow. with maybe five people answering. So, I mean, <laughs> talk about discipline, right? Going in day in and day out, getting rejected, you know, 40 to a hundred times a day with nothing to see from it. Um, but very quickly I, because I was putting in all this work, you know, spending time with some of the executives and the key staff to learn how they were successful. I got very good at the job in a very short amount of time. And so within six months I completely smashed their expectations. And so they knew that they wanted me long-term. They wanted me to continue to progress through the company. And so from there, I became a recruiter. So for those that aren't aware, a recruiter is someone that basically does what I was doing before, you know, reaching out to customer or to prospects, seeing if they're interested in an opportunity. Um, and there was a lot that a lot else that goes into it, prepping for interviews, making sure that if they were interested in taking an offer that they did so. Um, there's a lot that goes into it rather than just calling someone, seeing if they're interested and passing it off kind of like a lead. It's very similar to, for those that aren't aware of what a business development rep does is, you know, really you're just trying to get leads. That's mm-hmm. your job. So I got promoted into, uh, from a, the sourcing position to a recruiter position. And while I was promoted, they loved this role so much because they had no one to do it at the time that they wanted to replicate this. And so I helped to create a business model for them to replicate this job, this specific job across all of their branches. I think they had seven or eight branches ac- across the country and they hired about two sourcing brand, uh, two sourcing specialists in each of those branches. Wow. So you're the first one of that kind of position in any of the branches. You come in, you smash their expectations so much that by the end of it, they're hiring a couple for every branch. That's awesome. And it was, it was a great experience too, because again, you know, because they took a shot on me, I wanted to invest in them. Mm-hmm. And so I had no issues working extra hours to help put this plan together for the company to be successful. You know, it was kind of like, you know, they helped me out. I, ha- I have to help them out. Yeah. 
And so I guess in the short term, after this business development role, I was in a recruiting position. I did that for about a year. Um, they, they kind of, in recruiting at this company, you know, they had three month and six month goals for a first year recruiter. Or I'm sorry, not three, three or six months. I'm getting confused. Six month or year goals. Mm -hmm. So they had, you know, here's where we expect you to be in six months. Here's where we expect you to be in a year. I smashed my six month goals in three months and my year goals in six months. Wow. So I was beating expectations. Um, you know, there were other recruiters in the office that had been recruiting for five or 10 years and I was already blowing, blowing them out. It wasn't even close. Um, and so I want to go back real quick to something that you said about, you know, the discipline behind being able to make all those dials every day. What do you attribute just the ability? And I feel like, yes, there's a lot of discipline behind it. There's also another factor in that you have to be able to take that rejection of, you know, many of them not even answering. And when a lot, when they do answer, a lot of them are going to kind of tell you no or whatever. They're not all going to be successes, and most of them are not going to be successes when you get on the phone. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute the ability to really power through that and keep going, even though you might be getting discouraged when they're not all working out? That's a really good question. Um, I think it, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, you know, I think in the short term, as this is happening, right, as I'm as I'm picking up the phone for eight hours or nine hours, and every single every single uh, call is a no just letting myself know this will pass and eventually someone's going to say yes. Yeah. Eventually they're going to take a shot on this opportunity and say, you know what, this is, this is right for me. I'm interested in this role. And so in my head, I just had to keep telling myself that, right? I think a big factor and something that I, that I talk about now to some of uh, my reps we'll talk about later um, is you have to find something that drives you, right? You cannot do something at that discipline um, at that level consistently without having some reason inside you of why you're doing it. For some people, it's monetary. You know, I want to make X amount of money. For others, you know, I want to make sure that I can support my family. You know, they think of someone that they really care about. Whatever it is, you have to find something. And so I was able to find that in myself, and that really helped me push. Now, I'm sure it's kind of evolved and maybe even changed over the years, but what was that something at this point when you first got into it? <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, my goal was to be uh, making six figures in, mm -hmm. a, in, in my 20s. You know, in the yeah. next couple of years, my goal was, okay, I'm going to hit six figures. Um, I was able to do that, um, you know, but again, having short-term and long-term goals definitely helped. I knew that I wanted to be successful in sales. I loved every aspect of sales. I knew that this was probably the most difficult part of sales. And even to this day, I credit a lot of the success that I have today on being able to take rejection after rejection and still waking up the next day as if nothing happened. You have to, because especially in sales, if you're not building, if you, if you come to work and you're kind of dragging, the people that you talk to are going to see that they're going to feel that they're going to read into that. And so if you're able to continue to think positive, continue to, uh, you know, put on, put on that, those sales shoes for the day. Right. And, and go out there and crush it. It really does pay off in the long term. Absolutely. So by this time we're kind of at the point where you, you've gotten into this position in Cavaliero and there's more to your story that we'll get to. There is one quick tangent I want to sure. take that I don't want to pass over, which is, <laughs> And we talked about this a little bit before, but there was one point where we worked together. Actually, we've been friends for, I think, over five years now. We've known Something each other. Something like that. Since college, yep. since, yeah. Since the beginning <laughs> of college, we rushed a fraternity together, been friends ever since. But there's a, a position that we worked together in there somewhere. <laughs> was this before Cavaliero? It was during. It was during Cavaliero. It was during. So you had this position at Cavaliero, and then we ended up getting this position together where we were essentially canvassers for a hurricane <laughs> window company. Yep. They would drive us out to just some random neighborhood in the area, <laughs> just a big like <laughs> van full of us. And they would just drop us off yep. and say, all right, go door to door, start knocking. And you're basically, you're just trying to set up an appointment for like for actual salesperson to come in and finish the sale, try to sell them a hurricane proof window. Pretty much. We knew very little about these windows and it was not a very well through, well thought through position, but they were paying us $15 an hour. So we were like, the hell do we have to lose? Like, let's just go to, get yeah. some experience. To and be fair, it was a hundred degrees and we were also in khaki pants yes. and not dry fit polos, unfortunately. Yeah. So we very, were dying out there. Very thick cottony polos. I remember them yeah. well. Big bright green polos and we 
you know, we still did not look the part. We, <laughs> we none of us knew what we were doing, but we just we would go out there and we would just make all these knocks on these doors and try to make something happen. And you know, we were making money hourly anyway, so we were like, what do we have to lose? And I I think I for one got a lot of good experience doing that, like getting that kind of building up that tolerance for getting rejected, hearing no, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if I ever closed an actual deal on that i think uh, you got a few leads i remember i, did, I got a few i, I, I think you were the only other one to actually maybe get so a yeah but <laughs> either way it was uh it was tough work but it i feel like it taught me a lot and um you know that was it was cool that we got to kind of share that experience together like early on and that was as you were kind of getting into cavalier so mm-hmm. i definitely wanted to make sure that yeah, we went over that story. Definitely. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, that was probably a couple months after I had actually started as a BDR or um, a sourcing specialist. And, you know, the weekends uh, during the week, you know, face a ton of rejection. And then on the weekends face some more rejection. Exactly. But at least I was doing it with my friends at the time. You know, we had a lot of fun doing it and we learned a lot. You know, I think a lot of us, um, we, we learned a lot of different skills, whether it was, you know, having thick skin, ha- handling rejection, um, because getting your door slammed in the face many times, it's not that fun. Uh, no. <laughs> but I think, I, I think we all kind of grew from that. Absolutely. And I mean, so you're, 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 like you said, you're stacking the weekly experience on top of the weekend experience at this mm-hmm. point, just getting tons of that sales experience. So you kind of keep on in Cavaliero by this time, you know, we got to the point where you've got this new position where you're an actual recruiter. Yep. What does that look like? Because that's obviously, you said it's a different position. It's mm-hmm. like one of the regular positions. Is that full time? Yep. So at that point I was doing it full time while also going to school full time. Um, and so basically for a recruiter, the, the main difference is, is that, you know, let's say someone's handling you a lead. It's your job to manage the entire process. So you're pre-screening the candidate. You're handling the interview, coordinating with the client and the sales rep that is in charge of that client, making sure that everyone's on the same page on when they're going to show up. Because in the grand scheme of things, you know, at the time before COVID, a lot of these companies had a ton of interviews lined up. So let's say that there was miscommunication about an interview or whatever, and and the person was 10 minutes late. They said he's not a good fit or she's not a good fit, whatever it looked like. Um, So managing that entire process. And then obviously from a recruiter's standpoint, the end goal is getting them an offer, right? The interview goes well, the client wants to hire them. Now it's about negotiating salary. And so, um, you know, very quickly I learned how to do that successfully. And that's why I was able to hit my year goals in six months and my six month goals in three months, which then propelled me into a a sale, another sales position. So same company, same company. Yep. So from there, I kind of transitioned over to a more sales oriented role. So if you think about it, right, staffing is split into two sides. There's the recruiting side of it where, you know, those recruiters are in charge of getting candidates interested in an opportunity, finding the candidates that would even be interested in having a conversation. The sales side of it is getting the clients that want to hire people, right? You know, finding the clients that have a need for a senior, a senior IT specialist, a developer, cloud engineer, architect, whatever it looks like. Um, and then managing that relationship, right? Making sure that they know that doesn't matter, you know, where we find the candidates, we will find qualified candidates that will do whatever task you need. And so I kind of transitioned over it. Um, Cavalier took another shot on me and they wanted to create a business development representative program. Um, so I keep, I was getting those confused earlier because they're basically the same thing. They're an entry level, a sourcing specialist and a BDR is basically the same thing. One is on the recruiting side, finding the candidates. The other is finding leads for the clients, right? Finding yeah, client sure. leads, finding the businesses that have a specific project where they would need help staffing. And these are contract roles, permanent roles. So I was a, a team of nine. Uh, I was one uh, of the nine, and then they hired someone else outside to help kind of bring this program to life. Now, is the idea that on the client side, it takes a little bit higher skill level to be able to negotiate and handle those relationships than the other side? I would say it, it's yes, but at the same time, you know, these are completely different skill sets. Yeah. You know, I knew people at my company that didn't even touch the sales side of it because they were so good at the recruiting side. And then I had others where it was the same, where they were so much better on the sales side, you know, building those relationships with the clients where they never wanted to touch the recruiting side. Um, You know, the top 1% would do both. You know, Mm -hmm. they would kind of have a good balance of a good book of business and also candidates to fill those roles because then you're getting paid more because you're doing both sides of the job. Yeah. You'd handle one deal, the entire deal, you're getting the commission on both sides. Exactly. So, Ed, speaking of which, I'm Mm -hmm. guessing in that role, that's probably you're compensated on a commission of the 
negotiated salary. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Correct. So, um, and, and this is for most staffing companies. Um, you know, I won't Mine get into the, the ex- same way. Yeah. Exactly. So, so you understand, right? There's a specific percentage of the salary that is basically the fee for doing the work, for finding yeah. the candidate, for managing the relationship, and everything in between. Um, you know, because we're covering a ton of the overhead costs for it. Exactly. And um, so that, you know, when you start talking about that, there's an art of, you know, I guess kind of in the negotiation of the salary, you've got to figure out, okay, what are they willing to pay? And you don't want to exceed what they're willing to pay, but also you want it to be as high as possible for you to get paid on more of it. So, exactly. So you've got to kind of just get used to that. You got to really get in there and get a good idea of what that what that rate is, mm-hmm. probably research the company, figure out what their budget is. So there's a lot of moving pieces there. Absolutely. And again, you know, you have to understand for the client side of it, um, and even for the for the candidate, right? You know, this is a very, very small part of what they're doing. Whereas, you know, for a recruiter or for the sales side of it, this is all that we do. So for example, if I have a client where, you know, they're offering a specific salary and I have the perfect candidate for that role, sometimes the disconnect is in they they aren't willing to pay the salary that this person is worth, even though this is exactly what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So from your standpoint, you kind of have to almost come in as a consultant and say, listen, you know, we've been we've been trying to find this ideal candidate for you for six months, sometimes maybe even a year. Right. Because they're willing to wait that long to make sure that the project is done the way that they want to. And so when it comes to that, right, you have to kind of be the bad guy in a way and say, listen to the client you might have to push the salary a little bit. I know that this might not be inside your budget, but if you want this specific candidate, this is what you're going to have to pay. And if not, we need to assess the specific capabilities that you're looking for and maybe find a person that's not as experienced, maybe not someone that's not as much of a specialist to it. Now, in those cases where you have to have that conversation, which way would you say it goes most of the time? I would guess, I don't know if I am right here or not, but I would guess that a lot of times they're kind of like, Okay. Yeah, we were trying to control costs a little bit, but we really do need someone that is this capable. So fine, we'll raise our budget a little bit. Yes and no. Um, so you'd believe you'd be surprised. Uh, it really just does depend. I would say it definitely does help though if we have a cl- if if it's a client that we've had that ha- we have a really good relationship with. Yeah. Right. Because the, you can say you know, listen, Brody. I mean. I'm telling you this as a friend, but also as a consultant, Mm -hmm. I'm looking out for you and your business. If you want someone to do this in this specific time or, you know, with these specific capabilities, you have to raise the price because unfortunately, sometimes we do have to make the tough or we did have to make the the tough decision to say, listen, we're not going to be able to fill this position for these requirements Mm -hmm. because we're dealing with people. It's not a product, right? We can't force someone to work or take a job if they're not interested, yeah. you know? So it has to be mutually beneficial. But I think, uh, I would say sometimes it does lean more into the favor of kind of reassessing what they actually need. Maybe it's more than one person. You know, maybe maybe the salary was way higher than what they were expecting, but maybe if they find two middle, you know, maybe five year experienced guys in the IT world to do it, maybe they get the job even done faster and they work together, you know? So it's, it's kind of understanding the project, the needs, and also it helps if you have the relationship with the client. That's interesting. Now, one thing that that kind of brings up as just a question Mm -hmm. I just thought of is, uh, you know, in the interest of just getting an idea of what the general vibe is in that sector, uh, you know, on the employee side, what were some of the things aside from just the salary amount that employees were looking for a lot of times that were maybe maybe difficult to negotiate for the client, maybe not difficult, but just what were some of the things that were really important to employees in that sector mm-hmm. that they were looking for aside from just the salary piece? I think, um, and, and this actually goes back to a little bit of why it was successful too. I think if if you understand the culture that they're looking for, you know, I had I had companies kind of take a shot on reps, kind of like how Cavalier took a shot on me. And, you know, basically they found someone that was motivated and, and driven. Sure, on paper, they were not who they were looking for. But in the interview, they were able to position themselves in a way of saying, listen, yes, I might not know all the answers, but I will make sure I try to find a way. I will make sure that I do everything that I can to be successful. And people people take shots on people with that that have potential or that they see potential in. So was part of your job then um, when you were in the recruiting area, kind of coaching the candidates to really put themselves out there in that mm-hmm. way? That's a big part of it is, you know, 
So I would yeah. guess that part of the reason why you're successful, at least for part of it, was just that you sharing that ambition and that mm -hmm. ability to relay that to a company. It probably worked really well for you to be able to talk about that to these candidates because it was something that you really felt deeply inside yourself that you could relay that to them. Definitely. I was I was passionate about it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I worked with candidates um, that kind of had similar backgrounds as me. And I, and I said, listen, you know, I've kind of been in your shoes, maybe in a different industry, but you know, let me tell you how I've been successful and let's try to position you in a way that, you know, a company wants to take a shot on you. Because again, sometimes it's it's having that hard conversation with a candidate too and saying, listen, you know, they the candidate might be asking for a salary that's way out of line of of what they're able to do at this time. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, we're all people, we all have different goals, metrics, but kind of having that conversation and saying, listen, you know, if you kind of work this out, if you really position yourself in this way, it will pay off in the long term because on paper, you might not have the skills today. Taking this job will get you those skills and then you keep progressing, right? I mean, I think, promotions. again, this was two, uh, almost, well, I'd say probably four years ago when I was in this role. Um, at the time, I don't know what it is today, but people were only staying in jobs on average two to three years. Wow. Anything longer than that was a significantly larger, larger time. So that means that um, people that are, uh, people are progressing, you know, they're not just staying in one role. So, so don't look at your next job as something where you plan to sit in for the next 20 years, look at it as a stepping stone to wherever you want to go. Always try to take some time, um, you know, whether it's on a monthly, you know, maybe a yearly basis, New Year's resolution, whatever it looks like, kind of look in the mirror and say, okay, what do I want to do long term? Mm -hmm. And how do I get there? Am is what I'm doing today going to get me to where I want to go? And I don't think a lot of people have that kind of self analysis and take some time to really, you know, be self aware about what they're doing and where they want to go. What is sitting back and looking at that for you look like for like when you do that process, kind mm -hmm. of walk yourself through that process. What does that look like for you? Is that goal setting? Is that, you know, taking down some notes on like how things have changed since the last time? What is mm -hmm. your process there? Sure. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of everything, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, you, all, you can't just criticize yourself too much to the point where you don't want to do anything. But I think it's, you know, looking back, okay, where, where was I successful? You know, like what were some wins that I had this past year? And even, it doesn't have to be like sales wins where, okay, I closed this job or I closed a deal. It can be little wins. Like, you know, I learned how to train people. I learned how to build a, uh, build basically a program for other people to replicate, right? You know, I helped build that sourcing specialist packet of, okay, how to be, the best sourcing specialist, how, like what are specific requirements, you know, how, how do you do your job and how do you do it successfully? So, you know, also looking at it from the other side of, okay, what could I have done better? You know, was I really putting in all the effort that I wanted to? And more importantly, I think the biggest question is, am I on track to be where I want to be in three years and five years? You know, am I setting myself up? And sometimes the answer has been yes, I'm in, you know, right now I feel like I'm in a really good spot, but sometimes there were positions where I said, listen, I don't think I'm on track to, if I, for my goals, I'm not on the right path. And so I need to change that. How often are you sitting back in and having those kind of internal conversations with yourself? It, it varies. Uh, I would say this past year quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd say probably on a monthly basis, I'm saying, yeah. okay, you know, what can I do differently? How can I improve myself? Um, I think we're in a very interesting time post COVID where there's a lot of opportunity for people that really put in the work. It's very true. There's a lot of new opportunities being invented. And if you can, you know, kind of following suit with a lot of what you've done in your career so far, if you could figure out how to carve out those opportunities for yourself and come in with that ambition, the world's your oyster. Like you could just kind of do whatever there's the resources and the capability to do. Opportunities are endless. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So going back to something that you kind of touched on briefly there as you were talking about your process, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about how you figure out, you know, you, you mentioned inventing this new kind of system to help replicate yourself. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about how you replicate yourself. And there's a little bit that leads up to that because you're in a sales manager role now, as we mm -hmm. were talking about before. This is with a new company. So mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of transition to talking about that new company, how that opportunity came about. So let's kind of catch up to there. And then okay. once we get to the point where we're caught up to your management role that you're in now, kind of talk about what that looks like and some of the challenges and successes you've had there. Sure. 
So starting off from where, where I'm at in the story, right? So, you know, I, I started off Cavalier. They took a shot on me uh, in, our, in a role as a sourcing specialist. They made this role for me, basically. I crushed it. They wanted to replicate it. So I helped them replicate it. In the meantime, I was promoted to a recruiting position full time while I was also going to school. I crushed my year goals in six months, got promoted to a business development role. Again, another new program. There was nine of us. They had specific goals for us to hit. I hit those goals in two months and then I got promoted to a sales executive at Cavalier on the sales side. So not from the recruiting on the sales side. Um, same thing. Um, you know, whatever bar they set for me, I crushed it. I just found a way. It didn't, it didn't matter what I had to do. I, I looked at people who was, who were doing it successfully and I mirrored, I tried to mirror that and then tailor it so that it was set up for me to be successful because in sales, everyone's different, right? Suited to your personality, the way that you work. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, I think a lot of people nowadays in sales, they, they try, they think there's like a silver bullet, right? You know, you can be successful and okay, well, what did you say here? Well, you know, for you or or for someone else, it, it might look a little bit differently. Success might look a little bit differently. You might have to position yourself in a way to be successful. Um, and so it kind of varies, but anywho, so, um, you know, was successful on the sales side of Cavaliero, um, did a lot of, and, and again, I credit this to the hurricane proof windows that we were talking to before. If I had a client that I knew would be a good fit, but they weren't answering my calls, I got in my car and I drove to them. I didn't have a meeting scheduled. I wasn't able to reach them. I went to the administrative assistant and I said, hi, you know, I'm looking for John. Um, is he available? And John would come out and I say, Hey, you know, John, listen, I know you probably don't know who I am, but, uh, you know, my name's Zach Wallace. I work for Cavaliero and I think that we have a lot to offer you and your team. We'll love a few minutes of your, of your time. And more often than not, these people would be shocked that I would even do that. Right. Cause it's not door to door is something that I think is like a loss skill. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that it's necessary, especially post COVID, but back then it was something that no one was doing. Yeah. And so it got me a lot of opportunities. I had a ton of clients that, uh, you know, I was very successful with. And so I kind of at that time felt like I, I, I didn't say master, but I felt like I had kind of hit my peak of, okay, you know, I, I've learned everything at this point to, to in staffing, the, the only, the, the next step would be to run my own office is yeah. to, you know, take that next step. But, um, I didn't really know anything else. This was my first real job, um, or real, real company. And again, I can't thank Cavalier enough for everything that they've done for me. Even to this day, I, uh, I credit them for a lot of the, the, personality traits and the skill sets that I have. And so funny enough, uh, at another headhunter company uh, reached out to me about this com- this job that I'm at now. So uh, I took an opportunity with Finastra. Uh, Finastra, for those that don't know, uh, we're the largest pure play financial technology company in the world. Um, again, so sure. what does that mean? Real quick? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I know. Uh, For the layman. Sure. And, and again, at the time I had no idea. So yeah. I appreciate you <laughs> just pointing <laughs> that out. So f- largest financial technology company. Okay. So let's break this down for a little bit because mm-hmm. there's a few different industries here and it can get uh, pretty complex. So in the world, right, you know, you have financial institutions like let's say Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, um, you Bank know, of America. Bank of America, all of these big companies, they're huge trillion dollar banks, um, maybe even some credit unions. And they're so big that they have the funds to basically invent whatever they want to do. They have the funds to invent their own software to tailor it, right? They serve maybe like a good 40 or 50% of the world, right? Not just America, just in general, there are thousands of financial technology companies, um, banks, credit unions that basically lend to customers, but they might not have the funds to make their own software from scratch. There's a lot of money that goes into that. So Finastra, what we provide is we provide software solutions to some of these local or these other banks that aren't the Wells Fargo, that aren't the JP Morgan Chase, but we give them the opportunity to compete. There are smaller institutions that I work with that have way more robust software than some of the Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, and they didn't build it. They they relied on us to help provide them with that with those solutions. So are those typically kind of like packaged uh, softwares that maybe a few different companies are using, or are they proprietary and kind of built, you know, case by case? So that's a really good question. And I guess the short answer is that it depends. So we offer a uh, and what we call it is a breadth and depth of solutions. So in the banking world, there are so many different aspects to the banking side, right? Like if you wanted to go apply for an auto loan online, 
let's say, you know, Wells Fargo, one of those lar larger, even a smaller credit union, someone built that, someone built that application. Okay. So that's something that we might offer. We might offer on the back end the financial analysis or the spreading to determine whether or not lending to someone is a good fit. So um, is it profitable? Because at the end of the day, for people that don't know, you know, banks, credit unions, they don't work for free. That's this, the bottom line. <laughs> so yeah. some, someone at the end of the day has to make profit for them to want to do business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everything from determining whether or not someone has a likelihood of paying a loan back, um, the decisioning piece of it, right? Everything from that to even the core, what we call the heart of the bank, um, the core processing system. So, uh, or the host servicing solution is what we call it. Um, you know, Finastra has our own. Um, every bank or credit union has one. And it's basically like what makes the bank move without getting into the details. So I guess in the short answer of what we offer, we offer everything. Everything from application to origination, processing, all the way to the closing, the documents for the loan, right? Because some of these banks and institutions, they don't write their own legal legal work for these loans. Yeah. So we have attorneys and counsels that kind of draft these, make sure that they're constantly compliant. Like underwriting teams? Underwriting. Um, wow. You know, th there's, there's so much that goes into it. We have a solution. Um, it's actually called Laser Pro. And it's, own, it's used by more than 4,500 clients across the nation. Um, it is the most robust lending doc prep solution. We even we have an attorney and legal counsel in every single state that makes sure that those state regulatory requirements are met within a loan. So on the back end, um, you know, I know so how that stuff gets because so my staffing company has we have contracts at you know states all across the United States and we're running up we're pretty small still we started really got our first contract in September mm -hmm. um, but all of a sudden we found ourselves like nationwide and we're running up against all these different things where it's like, okay, well the regulations in this state differ from this state in this way and this way and this way. So we're, we're actually revamping our entire contract system right now just to make sure that we're meeting those state regulations. And I know how complicated that gets. So that's awesome that you have people in every state that can specialize because that's difficult to figure out. Like mm -hmm. even insurance wise, we've got, you know, all these different types of insurance we have to carry for our company and even just kind of calling around and figuring out which requirements happen from state to state it's complicated it's hard to find like most of the time there is not someone that knows the answer for even that many states mm -hmm. it's like you kind of have to have that specialist for each different type of state so i think that's interesting exactly so going back to you know the financial technology space and specifically this product Laser Pro, I'm very passionate about it. Um, not just because I've been successful, um, you know, leveraging it and selling it to clients, but also I've seen them go from these smaller institutions to you know increasing the revenue 10x, 20x. Um, you know, Laser Pro again, we have a legal counsel in every state. On top of that, we have a two million two million dollar compliance warranty. So just in case anything that we provide, let's say isn't isn't correct right like we didn't update our documents for a specific compliance regulation and on their side you know someone has to make sure that everything is moving correctly everyone is they're not just lending money to criminals you know there's a lot that goes into it so these banks and credit unions and other financial institutions they get audited so the government comes in and says listen we just want to make sure that you know you're doing all the right steps you're, you're lending fairly which is a big part of it too it's very easy for someone that doesn't have something like this to have a finding and it can have a reputational impact, financial impacts, more, more importantly, um, you know, there's a lot of different negatives to it. So having the peace of mind of, okay, listen, you know, we pur purchased the solution. We can just focus on building these relationships with the consumers and the customers to be more profitable and, you know, basically extend our portfolios everyone's happy. The auditors are happy because it's compliant. The bank's happy because they're building relationships, making money. And the customer's happy because they're getting the money that they need for a car or for a boat or a commercial building, whatever that looks like. So we offer, Laser Pro is just one. We offer a ton of solutions. And I think something really cool that we're doing, we're essentially building an app store for banks and credit unions. That's awesome. So up until this point, and, um, you know, I think this is something that has been very, very new. It was part of the reason I joined Finastra. Um, you know, so if you think about your phone, right, you have an app, you, you can have an app for anything, for weather, for games, for, for your bank, whatever that looks like. Finastra created a platform we call FusionFabric.Cloud 
where we can basically sell apps of, for example, like Laser Pro, or you know, if someone else has a good idea, you know, we can put it put it on our app store. It makes it very easily accessible to all of these financial institutions to use. Again, going back to the point of competing with these large sharks like Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, that way that they can they can service their customers in the way that they need to, so that way everyone's happy. And so we've been working on that for the past couple of years. It's officially rolled out. Um, you know, we're building some of our own apps to basically, you know, sell to and work with these financial institutions. But also we have open APIs. So let's say that you've got a good idea for an app. You say, listen, I think a lot of banks and credit unions would really benefit from this. You and your team could develop an app and we would help you have a platform for you to sell it on. So that we're kind awesome. of doing everything from working with other, what we call fintechs, financial technology companies, mm -hmm. um, as well as servicing the community banks and credit unions. So really, really exciting stuff that we're doing. Um, all of this is cloud-based. So for those that don't know, you know, it's very easily downloadable from the internet. You know, they might have their own servers, but it's not something on-prem that takes a lot of implementation. It doesn't take a lot of, uh, you know, six months to a year to implement. This is something that can download very quickly and that they can start using right away. Wow. So. I mean, your company is doing a lot, really being the financial, you know, the leading financial tech company, you're kind of carving out the pathway of, you know, the app store thing is so cool. I think you're kind of, you're not only the leader in the space, but you're allowing other fintech companies to grow by being able to access stuff like that. I think that's awesome. Exactly. And more importantly, we're, we're making it more cost effective for these people to service their customers. Because at the end of the day, yes, a bank or a financial institution is is for profit um, most of the time. At this, But at the same time, you know, they won't do business if their customers aren't happy. So at the bottom line, you have to make sure your customers are, are happy. And the way that we're able to do that is with a platform. It's similar to an app store. And these institutions are able to quickly download and get up to speed or catch up to, you know, some of the larger trillion dollar banks provide the same service. Yeah. So you clearly know the company inside and out by this point. I'm guessing that there was a lot of really like, you know, learning the fintech space, learning what your company did that you had to do as you first got into this position. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what your position first looked like when you first came on with Finastra and kind of how that position went, what it looked like, you know, really pivoting into a different space. Sure. So I think, um, <laughs> you know, staffing, I actually had a client that was a financial institution. So I learned on that IT side, the uh, cybersecurity side of it and, and how that operated. But moving from staffing to a completely different role, it was a sales position uh, within Finastra, um, basically selling software to banks and credit unions. And um, selling it, software instead of people, it's a pretty big difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah. There's so much more involved into it. And there's good positives and negatives. Um, but if you think about it from l understanding, you know, the different capabilities and industries within your job, one side of it is understanding financial technology or what, what people call fintech in the space, right? Understanding what we offer, what we do and why it's important. The other side of it is understanding your clients, right? So the banks, the credit unions, and the other financial institutions, what do they do? What does their process look like? And how can we benefit them? So again, kind of like how I mentioned earlier on, it's like drinking from a fire hose yeah. because you're, it's not like you're just learning one industry. You're learning so much. And to be successful, you kind of have to have a well-rounded um, aspect on all these different things. So when I was hired, um, you know, again, we serviced some of the larger enterprise banks and credit unions, but we had never really focused on the community market financial institutions, the local bank and credit unions. Um, and so I was one of the first 10 for this new department. We called it a digital sales role. So up until then, Finastra really only did sales uh, or they only sold to some of the larger banks and credit unions. And these sales reps would fly out. We call, we call them field sales reps. So they would fly out to these banks and credit unions in person, build a relationship, show what we have to offer, close deals, and, and do that all in person. Then they said, well, how can we do all of this more importantly, remotely, but also service the community markets that might not even know who we are or how we could help them. And so that's what, that's what my job was, is reaching out to these banks and credit unions and building that relationship. Digitally. Digitally, exactly. So virtual webinars, virtual calls, nothing in person, which was again, a complete flip from uh, hurricane proof windows and stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know? 
Um, so it was great though. I loved, uh, I loved the team that I work with the other nine reps that I worked with. Um, they were all amazing. And we quickly grew from a team of 10 to a team of 50 in two years. Wow. Um, and again, this was all some of it. I'd say we were about 30 people before COVID. And then during COVID, COVID I think we hired another 20. So again, going back to the sales role, uh, it was very competitive. We were all selling software and they would put our numbers up. And so it was basically, you knew where you stood against other reps. You knew how much you were bringing in. And so again, being a competitive person, I tried to figure out ways to, to be successful quickly. And, and I, and there's kind of a reoccurring thing that I've done even in staffing or just in general. And again, I don't try to reinvent the wheel. I think a lot of people out there try to start from scratch and it can take a lot longer. Whereas if you look at someone, your future self, right? Someone that's doing what you want to do successfully, how did you get there and how are you doing it today? I mean, what is a $20 lunch going to cost you? You know, that's invaluable. That's invaluable information that they're giving you compared to a $20 lunch. I'll pay that every time, a hundred dollars, whatever it looks like, because Absolutely. I was able to build relationships and look at some of the experts, some of the other field sales reps that have been doing this successfully. And I learned very quickly how to do it. Um, and then I also tailored it to my own style and that's how I was able to be successful. So I quickly, you know, rose through the ranks, closed a ton of business, um, you know, and up until I became a manager, uh, this past, or sorry, this past fiscal year, um, in six months, I closed about 90%, 96% of my quota. Um, so I was clearly on track to crush it. And then there was an opportunity to be a manager. I think it's very important to note when I was starting off in this role that I was hired the other, I was the only one out of those team of 10 that had zero banking experience, zero FinTech experience. And again, they took a shot on me. Um, I had no idea. Um, I really, again, drinking from a fire hose, I had to learn everything from scratch, um, start from the basics. And again, I was able to quickly rise to the ranks because I looked at the people that were doing it successfully and tried to replicate that as quickly as possible. Don't I overthink think, it. I think there's a really good point in there about just, you know, whatever position you're in, learn from the people who have whether you're in a position or whether you're working for yourself, you know, figure out a way to talk to the people that have done it before, mm -hmm. because there are going to be things that they did wrong. And if you talk to them and figure that stuff out, you don't have to do it wrong. You exactly. can take shortcuts and do it quicker. Like you said, you figure out how to be successful more quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's how to do it is figuring out the shortcuts of how do I not do all of these things wrong? that have already been done wrong by other people in this position. Exactly. And so I think this is something uh, for anyone who's in college or, um, you know, e you don't even have to be in college. Just let's say you have zero experience, right? Don't try to compare yourselves to others that have five years of experience, because something that I've learned very on is just because very early on is just because you have a ton of experience doesn't make you an expert or that you're good at what you do. Mm -hmm. So try to what I would recommend is find ways to be successful, reach out to some of the people that have been successful in whatever you want to do. It doesn't have to be sales. If you want to be in real estate or an actor, whatever the case is, try to find people that have already done what you want to do, your future self, right? Find your future self and try to replicate that as fast as possible. Tailor it because everyone's different, but if you can find a way to replicate that as fast as possible, you'll be successful in the long run. Now, in a lot of cases where you were working in, right, you're in a corporation where it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty evident who has done that before in your organization. Mm -hmm. You mentioned taking them out to lunch or something. Mm -hmm. What are maybe some other ideas, other tactics that a listener viewer might be able to implement that's a little bit earlier on to gain that attention? Because a lot of times that, you know, that successful person, if you find the right person, they're going to be a busy person. Mm -hmm. Might be hard to, for you to be able to make that pitch that, you know, their time is worth your time. So what are some tactics and some ideas in the approach there of, you know, finding that person and earning their time to be able to get that? It's a really good, uh, really good question. And I think it comes back to you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So if you aren't in a job, right, and you're looking for this first step or this first step towards your future self, reach out to someone on LinkedIn, you know, do your research, maybe social media, whatever it looks like. And just say, listen, you know, I've been doing some research. I think you'd be, I'd love the opportunity to just spend five or 10 minutes. P 
people love helping people. And if you can truly be genuine about your approach and say, listen, I'm really just trying to get something out of this. It doesn't have to be monetary. It doesn't have to be something where, you know, you're paying them for their time. People like to help people. So again, try to reach out as much as possible. Try to spend some time again, don't reach out to one person. They ignore you or reject you and then stop. I think a lot of people take rejection, uh, in a sensitive way. Again, look at it. Like how I talked about earlier, it's one step closer to a yes. So reach out to 100 people, 500 people. Shoot, if you're looking for an internship and they don't have one available, tell them you'll work for free. What's part-time going to do? If Again, if it's invaluable experience and it's something you want to do long-term, in reality, what's the, what's, what's the loss if you just work for them for a summer or um, you know, even for a short amount of time for free? It's a mutually beneficial thing. Yeah. And, you know, expanding on your point about people loving to help people, people do love to help people. People also love to be told that they're doing a great job at something. Mm -hmm. So if you can reach out to someone and be like, hey, you are killing it in the fintech sales space. Mm -hmm. I want to be in the fintech sales space. I want to learn from you because you're killing it. You know, you've already you've shown this person that you, one, are paying attention to what they're doing, really Mm -hmm. value what they're doing. But also, too, you're kind of buttering them up and saying, hey, you're killing it. And I want to learn from you because you're killing it. It's a great mm-hmm. approach. And again, it's not it, again, you have to be honest about it, mm-hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, people can read other people very well. Yeah. And again, as long as you position yourself in a way of, hey, I'm I, I love what you do. I want to do that one day. How can you help me out? Can, can I do anything to get some of your time? If you position it in a way like that, how could someone say no? And if you do your research and you find someone who genuinely is really killing it in that space, it's going to be easy to make that reach out because, I mean, you've done your research. You know why they're killing it. You know the metrics around the fact that they're killing it. You're just going to be like, I think you're a rock star. I want to learn from you. Exactly. Who's going to say no to that? Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's awesome. So. Getting back to your position, you know, you, you introduced the company, what you do, and kind of the factors leading up to you entering this management position. I'd mm-hmm. like to talk a little bit about the management because we were talking a little bit off air before this about that position, kind mm-hmm. of catching up there. Let's start with maybe, you know, what was the the biggest part of the learning curve of getting into management? Sure. So I think one of the biggest learning curves is that every you're not managing a team of yous, right? You're managing people that all have different management styles that they like. Some um, some people might have more experience than you. Some might not at all. You know, I mean, it's really treating everyone differently to be more effective. You can't treat everybody the same in management. Uh, everyone has their own drivers, the reasons why they enjoy what they do. Some, you know, it's monetary. Others, it's for other reasons they like the recognition, whatever that looks like. So under really spending some time, especially early on, understanding your team, you know, what drives them, what moves them, what do they like about management? The first thing I did in a management role was interview every single one of my reps and say, listen, you know, before this, we were all peers. As a manager, what are your expectations for me? And then let me tell you my expectations for you. We made that very clear from the start. So there was a level of respect for each of us and that we held each other to that. And to this day, even the team, you know, I still manage this team. They're all amazing. And we work so well together because we've already established that relationship. You know, I didn't come in as a manager and say, okay, well, this is what you're going to have to do whether you like it or not, I'm not a person that likes to micromanage. I never liked being micromanaged. So having that supportive style, I think was a big, big learning curve. And I really do appreciate Finaster's opportunity to, uh, to give me this because again, I've had little to no management experience prior to Finastra and they were again, willing to take a shot on me because they saw the potential. That's awesome. And I feel like, you know, there's a very subtle note in there that I think is very important. So I want to hi- take a second to highlight it, mm-hmm. which is that even just as subtle as it was, is you asking them first, what are your expectations of me? Mm-hmm. I feel like that goes a long way because right. that's you humbling yourself as a manager and saying, hey, this is a two way street. You're going to expect things of me. And understanding, you know, the, the subtext of that is you understanding if you're not doing well as a manager. Mm-hmm they're not going to do well as a salesperson because they need to be managed effectively. And you're telling them, Hey, you're going to expect things of me. What are those things? Let's go over those mm-hmm. so that I can be a good manager for you. Right. What are some of the things that, what, what's some of the feedback that you got from asking that question that 
kind of led you to maybe make little changes in your management style? Sure. So I think, um, you know, some of them had very clear direct, I want to meet X times a week. I want to go over X amount of metrics, understand, uh, you know, what's coming down the pipeline from upper management, you know, being transparent. Others were very broad and said, listen, you know, my expectation is that you're going to be there for me. And mm -hmm. so then I had to say, well, what does that mean to you? Yeah. You know, because that's very broad. Um, but how can I help you? Because, again, it all goes back to being genuine, being passionate about what you do. I if I'm going to take a management role and I was already committed at that point, I want to be a good manager. So how do I be a good manager? And that's by putting my team first. You know, I think a good manager doesn't micromanage and push their team they follow their team as like a supportive standpoint, you know, okay, what are some pitfalls? What can I do to help make them better sales reps? Because again, I can't treat this as like I'm managing nine me's because if, if that was the case, it would be chaotic, yeah. but it would also be completely different than how I do it today. And not everyone's driven by the same things as you, you exactly. know, the things that you were going back way back to the beginning of our conversation, you're talking about you have to find that thing that drives you. And that's a, a very strong part of the sales role in general. Absolutely. And that's not going to be the same for everyone. So and I feel like a big part is identifying that. And that was one of the questions that I asked is what drives you? Because I think in this role, especially in my position, you know, we do a lot of cold calling We're we're, we're really out there prospecting, you know, this, the, a lot of these accounts that we work, uh, they're not exist. They don't have a relationship. They don't know who we are, what we do, and more importantly, why it's important to them, why they should even listen. And so it's a very, very demanding job. It takes a lot of discipline, similar to what we were talking about with staffing. So finding something that drives you will push you to that next level. We'll say, listen, when this week didn't go well, when I got no new opportunities, when I didn't set any meetings with new clients, I know that next week's going to get better. And I look up at a photo of a family or I look up at a, at a picture of my goals over the next couple of years. And that's going to push me to push through this. And as a manager, if you're having a conversation around that with your team members and identifying that, you can say, hey, John, this week didn't go that well for you. It's going to get better and you need to focus on your son mm -hmm. because you're doing this for your son and you got to stay, you know, eyes on the prize, that kind of thing. Exactly. It allows you to get personal and really connect with people on what is driving them. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really important point there. Right. And not, and, and I wouldn't necessarily, it's not like something where you hang it over their head and say, well, don't forget about John, but it's say, listen, don't forget why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Don't forget why you pick up the phone sometimes when you don't want to. Don't forget those things because this time will pass and the next opportunity is that much closer. So just push through it. You know, for me, um, I think something that helped out a lot was doing competitions you know, sometimes what I would do is say, listen, you know, for the next couple of weeks, whoever, whoever's the top rep in the next couple of weeks, you're going to get a gift card, you know, so create some friendly, healthy competition too. That way that when I know things are, are, are aren't going our way recently, um, you know, how to push them. I think something that's kind of funny, um, <laughs> with, with my job is, you know, we forecast, okay. Forecast is not funny at all, by the way, but, uh, the funny part about it is that our team closes 80 to 90% of our deals in the last couple, the last two to three weeks of a quarter. You're so you're telling me about this and that is <laughs> nuts. Because so <laughs> let's zoom out for a second and sure, think about sure. what a quarter is, right? A mm -hmm. quarter is three months. three months. You said the last two to three weeks. I would of say, quarter. sorry, one, I would say one to two weeks to be more realistic. So one to two weeks, one to two weeks, We're closing 80 to 90% of our business for those three months and the yeah. last two to uh, one to two weeks. So a quarter is three months, right? So that's going to be even, you know, on the lower side, it's going to be four weeks in a month. That's mm -hmm. 12 weeks. Yep. So that's like a one to two weeks, very small slice of 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And re in reality, it's more like 14 weeks, mm -hmm. 80 to 90% of the business. That is 90%. an insane statistic. We're talking about millions of dollars in revenue, and we're bringing that in in the last one to two weeks of, of a quarter. And so how insane does that last one to two weeks look like? I feel like <laughs> you probably just become an absolute monk you probably like you probably lock yourself <laughs> in your office and just 
like do nothing else. I think uh, it's definitely on my mind, um, you know, kind of what drives, again, going back to, I have to look at what drives me, right? Mm-hmm. Where do I, I, I look at my goals long-term, where do I want to be? Um, you know, I've hit some of those goals recently, so that's also given me some momentum to keep pushing. Um, <laughs> those last one to two weeks are a little stressful. I can imagine. And again, for, for people that don't know in management, um, you know, again, this is a very, very large company. We do about $2 billion in revenue on average a year. Um, and I, I, we've got roughly 10,000 employees. So very, very large. We forecast often. And so for those that don't know what is forecasting in sales, we're basically telling our upper management how, uh, you know, what we're going to bring in for the week, for the day, for the month, for the quarter, for the year. And, you know, each sales rep in any sales role, we have a quota. We have a certain amount of dollars or profit revenue that we're supposed to bring in. And your expectation is to bring that in. So again, thinking about it from my team's standpoint, not every team is like this. We close 80 to 90% of that number in the last one to two weeks of every three months. And so we're having these calls with upper management every single month, uh, you know, on a weekly basis sometimes. When it gets towards the end of the quarter, we're having them daily. And so in those meetings, I'm the only one that has to basically explain myself because we're way behind the ball, Mm -hmm. way behind the ball. But sure enough, it's like a hockey stick. Every time we get close to those one to two weeks, we just shoot up and we close everything. And I'm really, really proud of my team and what they're able to do because we're like the A team. You know, like we we bring in more than what we say we're going to bring in in those last one to two weeks. Um, you know, without getting too much into the numbers, you know, we were expecting to bring in, I think about 200,000, we brought in closer to 350,000 in those last one and two weeks, blew out our number and actually helped our department. Um, you know, we actually helped our department and our organization hit their year goals because of those last one to two weeks. And And what did you come into those last one to two weeks at? Not even, I I don't even think we broke a hundred yet. That's insane. So, you know, we ended off, we ended up closing, um, you know, we, we finished finished off that specific quarter at I think 350 and we didn't even break a hundred in that. That's in that insane. So is a lot of the, so that sounds so insane. I, I would guess that, you know, to an extent, a lot of the, the beginning, maybe what 10 or so weeks of the quarter must be a lot of like laying some groundwork. Right. And then in that last one to two weeks, you're just Close, 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 close. Right? Exactly. And I think, um, you know, kind of in sales, a, a big, I think I've uh, heard some of your other previous uh, guest speakers talk about this. Mm-hmm. It's really understanding the client's needs and what they're, what they're doing. I don't believe that you can force someone to buy something that they're not interested yeah. in. But what I think you can do is understand their needs. And if you have a solution, you can position yourself in a way to be successful. A lot of the type of selling that we do um, that's very successful is value prop set, uh, value prop selling. So uh, basically, we understand what they're doing today. We understand where they want to go. We help them get there. And so we have solutions, obviously, that they're going to help them get there. But more importantly, for some of these institutions that, um, you know, they have executives and, and board meetings that kind of approve these, these uh, payments of hundreds of thousands of dollars, we actually have tools that show a return on investment on our products. So we say, listen, you know, here's the upfront cost of what you're going to pay. And here's how you're going to get there over the next three to five years. Because really, you're selling the fact that they're going to be performing a much different way, different way than they've ever performed before. Exactly. So it's really about, you know, you have to be able to get that buy in. You have to be able to show them exactly why they should believe that you're going to get them from point A to point B exactly. with what you're selling them. And I'll be the first person. I, personally, for me, I like to get to the no quicker. If I'm talking to a client, I'm going to push them to try to say no quicker because I don't want to waste anyone's time. And so, again, I'm never going to sell something to anyone that doesn't make sense from a cost standpoint. So if we can make it make sense from a financial standpoint, there's no reason you should invest it. If I tell you today and I say, listen, buy this for $100, $100. in a month, you'll have 1000 Why wouldn't you say yes? Exactly. It's that simple. And so getting that message across to the president, to these CFOs, to the board of executives that we speak to, getting them to understand the big picture. Because in the short term, if you don't do this correctly, and we've seen it time and time again with sales reps, if you don't do a good job of explaining 
the value prop behind what we're selling, all they see is a fat sticker price and they're not going to buy from you. Mm -hmm. But if you can tell them, listen, over the next three to five years, you're going to double your revenue. You're going to, you're going to do, you're going to create 80% of operational efficiencies, whatever that looks like and create value for them. They're going to notice that and they're going to be begging for you to sign. Sometimes we, we have clients where we position ourselves in a way that we know that we're going to change the game for them, that they literally call us begging for, for a contract to sign as soon as possible because they want to get the ball rolling. I, I'm realizing now how much I didn't know about your company, and it's so cool. Yeah, it's it's really cool what we're doing. Um, like it's, selfishly, I'm just like kind of nerding out on like how the <laughs> technology works and everything like that. It's so cool. Like that app store thing yeah. blew my mind. It's So that's a good analogy. I, I wouldn't. It, so it's basically like a platform that's similar to an app store. You go online, you know, you say, hey, I need something that's similar to an application or something. We've got solutions pick from, you know, review them, pick one that you like, you can easily purchase, download it. Um, we're making it easier for these smaller institutions to catch up and compete with the larger enterprise, uh, enterprise banks and credit unions. So think about it this way, right? You know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, trillion dollar banks. I mean, huge. They, they manage a ton of money, but you'd be surprised how many institutions have a billion dollars in assets and are still underperforming because they don't have the technology in place. During COVID, we were selling solution packages because people weren't ready for uh, for for remote to shut or they weren't ready for offices to shut down. You know, like we we were providing solutions to keep up to have the community markets thrive during COVID when branches were shut down to have online presence and online applications. So we were, I mean, we helped a lot of institutions not only service their customers but make a ton of money. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. At COVID was a tough time, so it was probably nice to be able to really like assure those companies and help those companies during that time. Definitely. So I want to go back to something that you said as you were kind of explaining the last point we were on. And there was something that you, you know, it reminded me of a conversation we were having off air. You said something about getting to, you know, someone that you're selling to the client, prospective client at this point, mm -hmm. something about getting them to say no to it first. Mm -hmm. Getting to the no you, quicker. Getting to the no quicker is what you prefer. Mm -hmm. That reminded me of a question that you mentioned that is a, a question you really like that I was going to ask you. And that question is, you know, would you rather win a sale or lose a sale? <laughs> I love this question so much because, you know, obviously for, for some, it might be very obvious to say, you know, I'd love to learn from a win because you can learn how they won the deal and et cetera. But for me, I was asked that question very early on when I was interviewing at Finastra. Um, and I still to this day ask this question to anyone who I hire onto my team. And the reason being is because my correct answer, right? I mean, again, you can position yourself in a way that makes sense for either way. But for me, I would rather in the short term learn from the losses. I would rather have a ton of losses in the short term, understand why they lost, but more importantly, what could we have done to help them win the deal? You know, anytime that I reach out to a sales professional that is some my future self, right? Or someone that's successful in something I want to do, I try to understand the hard times that they've had. Because when it's easy, sometimes it might be luck. Sometimes it might be everything just kind of fell in place. But when it's no, I mean, you can talk. I've I've worked deals in the past, million multi-million dollar deals that have taken me six months to a year to work on that fell through. And I've learned way more than for those than the ones that I've won that were, you know, similar multi-million dollar deals. So it really just depends. Well, um, what's the incentive to think about what worked well if it worked well and it worked? Exactly. Right? exactly. Like if, if you did close it, you're going to be too busy celebrating the fact that you closed it to really think critically about, you know, what worked to get me here? Because obviously whatever you did worked to get you there. Mm -hmm. If it didn't work, you're going to be going back and looking at it like, damn, this did not cut it for exactly. me. Exactly. Like, how and am I going to do it next time? Exactly. And again, I want to make this clear, right? When you're talking to some, when you're trying to get your foot in the door to an industry that you want to work in the next three to five years, and we were talking about this earlier about, you know, positioning yourself in a way to be genuine, say, listen, I'd love to learn from you. That's completely different than a sale where you are trying to learn from your losses. Because again, going back to after the deal has been lost, when you try to understand, okay, what I could have done differently, those key points that I've learned from have helped me win way more deals than the ones that I've actually won in the first place, right? So again, learn from your mistakes and more importantly, understand how you could have done things differently to position yourself in a way to win. That's awesome. A lot of people don't do this. 
feel like those those losses and those you know when the deals fall through probably burn in your memory a lot bigger <laughs> than the wins. Right? I mean, these deals, these software deals that we do are very very complex. They take a lot of time to close. These aren't these aren't deals that. I'll call a client on Monday, they'll close Friday. You know, these are deals where I'll call them, you know, today, they might be interested in three to six months, but they might cl not close for another year. I've had a, the longest deal I've had took almost a year and a half to close. And it was right before I became manager. Um, and it took me so long because of their timing, because they had other projects that they wanted to focus on. But again, a very, very big aspect of that was, you know, touching base, building that relationship and consistently checking in, making sure that we were doing everything that we needed to do so that they would eventually sign. And it worked out in our favor and they're actually killing it right now. How does managing that relationship over such a long time horizon work? Mm -hmm. Do you have kind of like a touch schedule of sorts? Are you familiar with that term? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would it's set probably up, called a lot of different things in a lot of different roles, but sure. I've heard it called that before. A touch schedule, I call it a cadence, you know, mm -hmm. a, a routine cadence to check in. Again, that looks different for everyone and, and their own personality styles. You know, I've had some clients that, you know, they're, they're, these deals take almost a year to close and I only touch base with them once every other month or once a month, just check in, see how things are going. What can we do to help kind of push the conversation? You know, I've had others where they want to check in every other week. So really, again, comes down to what do they want? What's important to them? Because everyone's different. You know, it's not like, again, when, when you are completely starting off in any sales role and you are cold calling prospecting, my personal opinion, call them every day until they tell you not to. Mm -hmm. Call them, email them, text them, whatever it takes. If you can show up, you know, people appreciate that. Again, you're not being annoying because chances are you're not the only one doing this to them. A ton of other companies, not even just, you know, we're talking about fintech right now, not even just fintech. A lot of other companies are trying to do the same thing. So how do you separate yourself? Something I would like to go back to sure. is, you know, the fact that you are, you know, you're managing the sales team. You're bringing in a lot of people with more experience than you in a lot of cases, because I've seen this before. I've experienced this and I've seen it, you know, secondhand when you're put into a management position where your peers are older than you or even mm -hmm. the people that you're managing are older than you, which you're in both positions right now, a lot of times that comes with a lot of pushback because, mm -hmm. you know, people are like, well, they're younger than me, less experienced. Why are they in this position? You are the coach managing this team of mm -hmm. professional athletes, right? Yep. You have identified that as the manager of this team, you're the coach and these people are these insane athletes that have been taken in by this company because they've proven their prowess and their craft in right. different areas. So it's your responsibility to just coach them and make sure that they are going to be best served in their area. Exactly. So what are some coaching tips that you have? Tips that you would give to someone in a management position that's maybe maybe earlier in the process, but someone finding themselves in a similar situation to yourself where they're managing someone who, they're managing a team of people who are better at the actual craft than they are, and they just have found themselves in a management position. So coaching coaching skills or coaching tips for uh, you know managing a team that might be older than you or more experienced than you uh, in, their, in their previous work life, I think it's really just keep your head up for one, um, you know, you have to understand that you're in this role for a reason. Um, but I think it's also to don't ever assume, don't ever assume that you know how to, how they want to be managed or don't assume how you can make the team better. I think again, well, like we talked about earlier in the interview, understand what pitfalls or what cracks do they have today? How can you help those? Because if you can clear their path, you can make a killer team. Uh, I really give kudos to my team. They've been really successful. And part of that is because I have such a good relationship with each of them. They reach out to me anytime they need help. Anything that anything whatsoever, it can be work related or if they just want to talk, they know that I'm there for them and that I have their best interest at heart. And when they know that, they go to bat for me and they work hard. So even though I'm not managing a team of nine me's or whatever that case looks like, I know that they're working as hard as they can to be successful. And even though, right, in the last one to two weeks, we closed most of the business. And for me, it's it's so stressful and <laughs> I sometimes become a monk, right? Um, I know that my team will come through for me and they haven't let me down yet. 
I love that. Another question that I like to ask in every interview, Zach, is, you know, your your industry here, if you took it out on like a, a very broad scale, zoomed all the way out, is kind of common denominator wise is sales, right? Mm -hmm. That that's kind of your craft. Sales, sales management now. Mm -hmm. If you were you know, going back in time and telling your your past self as you were getting into this industry, couple different things to do as you're getting into it. What are some different approaches you would take, some things you've learned that you would tell that past self version of you to do differently as you're getting into the industry? Mm -hmm. I think a, a, a really big one that comes to mind is don't be so hard on yourself. Um, you know, we're, we're in a day and age where everyone wants very quick satisfaction. They want results immediately. And for something like sales or, you know, any other type of industry, really, it takes time to work on your craft and be successful. So pick your head up. It will get better. Time will pass. You know, there were some times where even whether it was in Cavaliero or even at Finastro, where my head was really down for a little while because things weren't going my way. Um, but I was successful in the long run. So just, just pick your head up. I think another piece of it is to have fun along the way, right? I think it kind of goes hand in hand with picking your head up, but finding ways to make the little things fun, whether it's, you know, just competing with yourself, trying to be the best self that you can as you work or try to compete with, with others, with your peers, whatever that looks like, make it healthy, make it fun. Um, especially in sales where we all have a number that we need to hit to, to be successful, um, you know, push yourself to compete with others. I think competition is very healthy. I love that. I love that. That's a great answer. And, um, you know, one other little segment I want to bring in here and I got to give you credit for this one. We were talking off air, this idea or this segment was your idea. I'd like to go over just a few kind of key takeaways that we had, you know, thinking about the things that we, the common denominators, the common themes that we talked about in this interview, mm -hmm. just the few key takeaways that we got out of this interview. Sure. So I think the first, um, and this just doesn't apply for sales. I think anyone who's very early on in their career can kind of benefit from this. Find your future self. Um, find someone that is who you want to be in three years, in five years, in 10 years, whatever that looks like, and try to reach out to them. Like we talked about early on, be passionate, be genuine about your approach. People are inclined to help people. So use that to your advantage. Be successful, build better relationships. Um, the next piece, be a pioneer and never settle. Um, a lot of the times I was stacked up against people that were way more qualified for a role or shoot, even with Cavaliero, I, they didn't even have a role for me. But because I did my research, I prepared, and I told them, I said, listen, I will provide value, and here's why. They took a shot on me. So don't just think because it hasn't been done before that you can't do it yourself. Be a pioneer and never settle. Love that. The last one, um, going back to the management, um, if anyone's a manager or even just a young professional who's managing a team of people that might be older or might have more experience than you, be a supportive resource and don't ever assume. Don't ever assume that you know all the answers, even if you were in a role before. Um, always reach out to them. Have one-on-ones with each of your uh, individuals that you that report to you and really understand what they need to be successful. Because if you ask, they will tell you. I love that. Well, Zach, I feel like that's a really great place to end cap this here. You talked about you know, the key few takeaways that you had. Just wanted to thank you again for coming on. This has been a fantastic conversation. Sure. Thank you for having Absolutely me. Absolutely one of my favorite, if not my new favorite. Really you might end up being the longest interview I've had so far, <laughs> which is pretty cool. It was good. It was it was a really good podcast, and I really hope the the viewers that are watching really take something from this. Um, I think that um, you know Brody's doing really good. Uh, you know, really great things over here, interviewing a lot of professionals. So um, if you haven't checked out some of his other professionals that he's interviewed, I would definitely take some time. You can learn a lot. You can learn a lot from them. Anything you'd like to plug? Um, no, I mean, uh, I don't really have much to plug. Um, you know, I think a, a couple of, sh I guess a, a couple of shout outs, maybe that's a little bit of a Give plug. as many shout outs as you um, want. You've earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'd say first and foremost, I want to shout out my parents because they've always pushed me to be my best self. 
Um, I want to thank the friends around me, you know, like you, Brody, appreciate you having me on this uh, podcast to kind of help promote my brand. But, um, you know, outside of that, really appreciate Cavaliero for taking a shot on me. I wouldn't be who I am without Cavaliero really stepping up and taking a chance with me, even though they didn't have any position. And I really want to thank Finastro for giving me the opportunity to learn about FinTech and, and really help uh, help the community market space and the community financial institutions. We're doing a lot of really exciting things here. And this is only the beginning. This app store is launched, uh, but I mean, in three, five years, it, there's the possibilities of what we're going to do are endless. So um, you know, Brody will plug this Instagram, um, you of course, know, I'll TikTok, put everything in the LinkedIn, details. So of, uh, if you're listening on audio on, you know, Spotify, Apple music, whatever audio platform you are listening on, be in the details of this podcast. If you're listening on or watching on YouTube, uh, it'll be in the details of the video. Definitely. And one last thing too, you know, if you are out there, if you're watching this and you are someone who doesn't have much experience or you are someone that has experience and just want to have a conversation, just reach out to me, DM me somehow. I'm more than happy to help others as others have helped me. So, you know, I'm always an open book. And again, really do appreciate the time, Brody. Thank you. And likewise, Zach, this has been awesome. This has been Profession Session. My guest has been Zach Wallace of Ooh. Finastra and a lot of other <laughs> things that helped get him to the point that he's at now. Zach, thank you, thank you again for being on and I'm gonna go ahead and sign off here. Thanks so much for tuning into Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. Stay tuned for new episodes every week and short clips of deep dives into specific topics that I put out on different social media channels. We can be found on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, all major podcast platforms. You can find my guest in the details of this video or podcast. And if you happen to know a young standout business owner, professional, or entrepreneur that you would think would be a good fit for Profession Session, DM me or get in contact with me anywhere and just let me know and they could be the next to tell their story here until next time again this has been profession session stay focused stay hustling and stay networking